It gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you tonight our guest speaker. She has written numerous books on uh, women patriots in South Carolina. Uh, she has not written uh, about tonight's uh, hero, hero in heroine, heroine, heroine. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I put the uh, beer at uh, Be in her bonnet. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, in, in fact, uh, Sheila has won a, a, an award. The uh, Gilmer. Bob Gilmer Moss. Bob Gilmer. Yes, sir. Uh, is that. Uh, as a South Carolina DNR mm -hmm. right. Well, without further ado, an evening with Sheila Engel. I'll just let you know I'm not going to dance or do anything <laughs> like that, okay? Though so we could, do, it's been suggested that we could do that and that maybe keep ourselves a little bit warmer tonight. But I'm thinking that we probably will not. Thank you for being here. What a yuck night outside. But it's nice to be inside, is it not? Um, when Tom asked me about uh, speaking about Emily Geiger, Giger, you can toss it up in the air and see which way you want to pronounce her last name. Uh, it, I thought, okay, I've heard the, a little bit of her story. I bet there is more. Well, there's not a whole lot more. I'll just tell you that. Uh, but I enjoyed doing the research about her because it got me into the Southern Campaign. You know about the Southern Campaign and the importance of it and how it made sure that the Patriots won the American Revolution. So, I'm going to get to go back and give us a few snippets of the Southern Campaign and how it started and some of the major battles and that kind of thing. Kind of a sequence of events to get us to Emily Geiger and what she did for our country. First off, everybody knows that South Carolina had more battles, skirmishes, all those fought in it than any other colony, right? We were numero uno for whatever case that may be. And sometimes that was in backyards, sometimes it was on a battlefield, sometimes it was in mills, you know, all different places those battles were fought. Sometimes it was brother against brother. Sometimes it was father against son. A lot of people have described the American Revolution as the first civil war, particularly in the South. So, let's go back to May of 1780 when Charleston was being attacked by the British. The onslaught of Charleston started on April the 2nd, 1780. And Americans suffered their very worst defeat at this particular battle. That it was not over until May the 13th, so you can imagine the bombardment. If you've been to Charleston, you've seen all the logos of everything that there is about that particular battle that went on and on. Major General Benjamin Lincoln finally surrendered, unconditionally, unconditionally. And we know that that word means that nobody gets any favors, right? Nobody. So neither did the soldiers and neither did the commanders. But British Lieutenant General Sir Henry Clinton and his army of 10,000 took over Charleston. His particular boss, we could say, was a man by the name 
of General Lord Charles Cornwallis. It's very important that you have all those words in there, okay? Because it was important to them. This was part of who they were as far as the army was concerned. It was part of their identification. And so I think it's good for us to tell, to use all those words. The British captured over 3,000 of our Patriot troops then. Put them in jail, sent them off to the Bahamas, did all, sent them to Florida, all sorts of things they did. And they only lost 250 soldiers. So that says to you a little bit that it was one side, no doubt. Cornwallis was left by General Clinton. Clinton decided that he needed to go to New York State. He heard that the French were coming in to help the Americans in New York State, and he thought he needed to be there. So he left, and he left Carolina in the hands of Cornwallis. Well, anybody not seen the Patriot? <laughs> not. I think that's the right way to put it now that you know that it's right. I watched it about a month ago and was just fascinated once again with not all their eras of historical accuracy, but just the sense of the time. And you can't get away from the accuracy of that. Those were the kinds of things that happened. And General Cornwallis was very lighted up, just so he was. And he made sure that the men that were under him knew that the next thing they were going to do was to take over Carolina. <coughs> so he sent his good buddy, Bannister Tarleton, out. We have the Battle of the Waxhaws, and then we see Tarleton moving over and under and around all of Carolina under the orders of Cornwallis saying, take care of these men that call themselves patriots that are really insurgents and that they are fighting against our king. Well, as we know, Charlton <coughs> took him at his word and did some horrific things, mainly at the Battle of the White Souls. But he wasn't the only one. The thing that we need to know, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that this was considered sort of the first civil war, as far as Carolina was concerned. There was a lot of payback going on during the Revolutionary War. Uh, friends who had quarreled over the line between their, their land grants, they were getting back at those people, trying to get back at them, and they were not being nice about it. There was burning, there was looting, there was killing running people out of their homes, destroying crops, uh, stealing animals. So, and of course, that was important to people's survival. They had to have the horses, the cows, the sheep, the chickens, right? I mean, it was a, a necessary component. So there was a lot of violence. And this was violence in small groups, it seemed to be, like 10 or 12 men of like mind, be they Tories, or be they patriots, were trying to, the patriots to save their land, the Tories to take their land. Um, after the Battle of Camden in August of 1780, Cornwallis marched into North Carolina, but he did not leave South Carolina by itself. He had a man that was was his inspector of militia. And you might recognize his name if you didn't know his title. It's a man by the name of Patrick Ferguson. Patrick Ferguson had a group of Tories that he was leading from place to place all over South Carolina. And his thing was, of course, to get rid of the Patriots, to be sure that they knew that there was a stronger force around for them. And so we get to the Battle of King's Mountain. And in that battle, October the 7th, 1780, you're looking at just a few months after May, right? We've got another huge battle. And it's interesting to note that Major Ferguson was the only British 
soldier that fought in that battle. That battle was fought by Americans on both sides. Both sides. And you read stories about it, some of the men that fought there and how they turned their backs on their cousins, how they turned their backs on their brothers. It was, that's how I want you to realize tonight that it's, that it's important, I think, to know how deep seated the men that real and the families that wanted to keep their land. I know when my granddaddy was um, diagnosed with lung cancer and finally got out of the hospital and went to, got up to his home for about three more months. Um, mother let him out of the car and he got out of the and he went and he knelt down his front yard and patted his land. That's the feeling I get of during the Revolutionary War. That's how important their land was to me. So here they are. There they, with the Battle of King's Mountain, you've got the Over Mountain men that we've heard so much about that came down from Tennessee. So interesting the way they just carry people along with them. And I think it's interesting, you may not know this, and I'm going to throw out some names as we go along as I've already been doing, that it was a woman that they got their gunpowder from. A woman that made the gunpowder for all the Over Mountain men that came down from Tennessee. So I want you to realize, I want us all to realize that the women were involved in this too, in a military effort. So one of the things I thought was interesting, I ran across this quote from White Quotes. Uh, so Henry Clinton said about this battle of Kings Mountain, he said, it was the first link in a chain of evils that followed each other in regular succession until they at last ended in the total loss of America. Of course, that's hindsight. They didn't know it at the time. But that was the first biggie, and it happened in Carolina. Major General Nathaniel Brennan, I'm sure you probably heard his name, was appointed by General Washington to be the Continental Army's Southern Campaign Commander. He decided that it was going to be wise for him to divide the Patriot troops that he had. And he, he didn't come down from the north with a whole lot of them, but he sort of gathered people as he went, and he did have a good size on them. He thought that it was important to divide them because already there in 1780, they had so many, 881, excuse me, they had so many, the 80 and 81, so many people that were trying to get the same foodstuffs. You've heard the comment that an army rolls on its belly. It's the truth. If they don't have food, they can't go. They can't fight. So this is what he, he was quite the strategist, was Nathaniel Brady. And this was one of the things he decided. So he started dividing up his continental army to see that he could get um, the British on multiple fronts. Rather than just attacking one, one group, he divided, sort of did that divide and conquer thought that so many other armies had used. And then we have the Battle of Calpins, as was mentioned a few minutes ago, January the 17th, 1781. Bannister Taunton again, 1,100 redcoats and loyalists, after Daniel Morgan, 300 Continental riflemen and some 700 militia. If you've not read the story, any of the stories about General Daniel Morgan, I encourage you to read them. It's a fascinating man, fascinating man, wonderful leader. And he asked of uh, his men just what he was going to give himself. He said, set the example. You might have heard the story on the night before the battle of Cal Pins, how he went around to all the different campfires, pulling up his hunting shirt and showing those scars from the 99 lashes that he had taken from a British officer. And 
He did those kinds of things to encourage them, to show them that he was willing to give it all. And he expected that of, of them also. Devastating loss for the British. Minister Tarleton was soundly defeated. Um, the Americans lost less than 100 casualties. More than 800 British troops were either killed or wounded. Pretty good show there for the Patriots, for sure. Okay, let's get to 96. That's the next little battle that we're going to talk about. 96, such a funny name. And of course, the thing is, it's 96 <coughs> miles from the Cherokee Village and 96 miles to Charleston. So there you go, the name of 96. Go figure. You know, wasn't that original? I love it. I love it. <coughs> okay. Now, at this point in time, 96 is in the hands of the British. A very strong contingent of British soldiers. And Green feels like he needs to take down that fort. All right. They had two different forts there. The Star Fort. Anybody been to 96 and walk around? Fascinating, is it not? Yes. Totally. So they had the Star Fort and the small stockade fort. And of course, the thing about it was that all of these loyalists that were uh, colonials, they were entrenched, I guess you would call it, <coughs> in that particular fort. So Green had to get them unentrenched. And his thought was about digging trenches to get to them. And this is what he did. He did zigzagging trenches to get to them. Well, you know, that he did pretty well. He was getting on up in there. But from May 22nd to June 18th, the siege continued daily. It's a long time now. Long time. Um, the Loyalists were able to keep their water supply. And we all, we all know how important a water supply is it to, to any group, whether it's our home or whatever, right? So they were able to keep that. And finally, Green heard that one of his arch enemies, a man known by Lord Francis Rome, was on his way to 96 with another group of British soldiers. And he realized there wasn't any way they were going to be able to take the fort and fight off Broughton at the same time. But before they left, there was a lot of fighting going on. The um, Americans attacked. They tore, about, tore apart the Loyalist sandbags. They captured both the forts with the supporting fire from, from snipers. They were able to do all that. And then those Tories' stubbornness, I guess, they retook it. They retook it with bayonets. We know what bayonets will do, do we not? And they also retook it with clubbed muskets. It was not a pretty sight. It was not a pretty sight. Um, Rain decided to withdraw. His men were tired. I mean, tired. They didn't have enough food. They were going running on empty, as we would say today. Yes, that's what that's where they were. And so he decided the best thing to do was to retreat, to backpedal, <coughs> if you will, to get away from them a little bit. The Americans during this particular battle, and I don't know, but I think these numbers are so important for us to hear the numbers. The Americans suffered 147, the British 85. Again, numbers are sort of outside of them. Okay, so Green failed to take 96. So, but he left, went to um, a fork that was formed by the Broad River and the Inuit River. Walked, of course, his men, those that walked, those that were riding horses, that's where they went, and camped. 
He knew that they needed some time. It was important that they had some time. Three days, three days after he, they were able to make camp, Channel Brain got word from one of his messengers in a dispatch that Ralph was on his way. And he knew that he needed to do something. He didn't know exactly what to do. He knew that he could not probably take him out the way he would like to, just by himself, that he needed some help. Tom Sumter was the man that he had in mind to get that help from. Okay. <coughs> to do this, <coughs> he had to get one to Tom Sumter. And Thomas Sumter was not really close by. He was camped near the Lottery <coughs> River, which was about three days riding away. So he started talking to some of his men, his men that he knew were able to uh, handle a horse and handle dangers because the whole trip from beginning to end was through Tory territory. Danger, danger, danger. And not only Tory territory, but there were swamps and there were forests. So it was not going to be an easy route. So he called for a volunteer from his men. Nobody volunteered. And then he started sending out words to the surrounding area asking for a civilian volunteer. Okay. <coughs> I was interested in this ride through Tory land. And I think we can understand that, can we not? It sounds like a suicide mission, right? I mean, can we just call it like it is? It sounds like a, a suicide mission. And they were not willing to do that. Well, about two miles from where General Green and his men were camped was the residence of a well-to-do German woman, a man by the name of John Fire. John was disabled, even though he was a staunch patriot, he was not able to fight, but he believed in all the patriot causes, and it was very interesting that there were just a few in the section of the country that were patriots, because most of them were Tories. But he stood out because of that. Uh, his father, a man by the name of Abraham Geiger, had arrived in South Carolina on February the 1st, 1737, on the ship Prince of Wales. I don't know if you've heard of that ship or maybe of that position in the uh, English government uh, monarchy. But um, they arrived there and with um, his wife, three sons and a daughter, and he received a land grant of over 300 acres that was uh, dated 1742. And from that first generation that came, then the other, the, the son and the wife inherited land and they set up their housekeeping. All right, his wife's name was Barbara. Uh, their home was on the east side of the Broad River in Fairfield County. Now, he had an 18-year-old daughter by the name of Emma, who had, of course had been born here in America. And she had caught the passion for the Patriot cause. There was nothing about her that was would have anything to do with the Tories. She, in fact, when uh, men of the Tory persuasion <coughs> would come and try to court her, she would have nothing to do with them. She was that staunch patriot. She was a strong woman, she was daring, and she saw to it because her mother had died, she saw to everything that was going on on the plantation. People often heard her say, oh, how I wish I were a man so that I could fight for my country. And when I read that, I thought, you know, and she clenched her fist when she said that mm -hmm. because she really meant it. She
she really wanted to fight for her country. So, there you are. General Green needs a scout. He needs someone to take order to Thomas Sumter. One day, uh, Mr. Geiger had a friend of his that was over visiting, and the friend was telling him about the dilemma that Green was in, not being able to find anybody to go and get the word to Sumter so that they could take out Robin. And Emily heard it. He heard the conversation. She heard the conversation. She didn't even think about it. She immediately went out of the house, saw to it that she got her horse, and went to talk to General Green at his camp. Well, you think about it. Here is this most influential commander of the Southern Army, and here comes this cute little girl. I'm just saying she's probably cute. I don't know if she was or not. In her long dresses, you know, and bonnet, and all the paraphernalia that the women or back then, you've got to picture this, y'all. Like it comes alive to you when you picture it. And she comes in and says, yeah, I hear you've got a problem. And I want to solve it for you. I want to take the dispatches to Colonel Sumter for you. Can you imagine what he must have thought? I'm glad he didn't probably say what he was thinking. But he <coughs> probably, you know, uh -uh. this is what God sent me. General Green was a godly Quaker man. Godly Quaker man. She talked to him and talked to him and talked to him. She told him what a good horsewoman she was. Even though riding side saddle for three days doesn't sound like a good way to travel to me. But she convinced him that she really wanted to do this. And she could do it because she had an uncle that lived over, over there um, and that she could get say to anybody that stopped her that she was going to visit her uncle. So she had an excuse. So she kept talking and kept talking and he kept listening. And he finally said, okay, I appreciate your help and I'm going to, I'm going to thank you for doing it in advance. So he wrote out this very small, very short message to General Sumter, telling him about Rowden, telling him that they needed to get after him and get him in between the flanks of the two armies, and they needed to take this man out. Well, he told her what the message said, I think that was the smart thing to do. He didn't just write it and she put it away. He told her what it said and he said, you need to memorize it. You need to memorize it. Just in case you get caught. And if you can get rid of the message, get rid of the message because they'll hang you as a spy. Because this is what she was offering to do. As a courier, she was carrying a dispatch for enemy territory. Mm. So, here you are. So, she starts off. And unfortunately, there was a Tory spy in his camp that had heard part of the conversation. And he decided that he was going to follow her and see what he could do about catching her and seeing to it that she did not get the message to something. Her activities to a man called Lowry and <coughs> made sure that she was followed. Emily had no idea that she was being followed. And since it was a short part of the day, she had to stop at a family that she really didn't know, who seemed friendly, but were not. They were secret Tories. 
And of course with that, they offered her food, place to sleep, all that kind of good stuff, and just, you know, being the kind of people that they were. And recognizing her as maybe not being what she said she was. So in the middle of the night, that man that was tracking Emily, he showed up, I know the door, told them who that he was looking for, etc. The family said, yes, she was there, she was asleep. And he decided, okay, well, I think I'll catch you all shut up. And I'll get her in the morning. Emily <coughs> had good hearing. She heard all this to do going on at the front door. And of course she decided she was not staying there. She climbed out the window, got her horse saddled up, and took off. Um, pushing her horse to get away from there as fast as she could. Okay, she's on a, this road, trail. We think road, y'all, but we're talking trail. You know, like horse and trail. And <coughs> the next morning, she is stopped by three British soldiers. Uh, they're coming toward her. She's heading this way. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to hide. There she was. They realized that she was traveling alone. That was obvious. They wanted to know what Miss Annie she was up to, where was she headed, all those kinds of things. And Emily had a problem about lying which I find most interesting. She would blush profusely when she did not tell the truth. I can see where that would be a detriment sometimes, you think? And this was one of those times when it was a detriment. She was trying to tell her about her uncle and all this other stuff, and they obviously decided that she was not telling the truth to them. And so, they took her into custody and they took her to Fort Francis Brown. Right. Okay, so here we are. He was camped about a mile from Fort Randy, so he was in the general direction there. She talked to him, told him the same sort of story that she had told these three soldiers. He didn't really read her. And he pushed a little bit, and she, no, she stuck to her story, and he said, well, we're just going to have to search you. And he was a gentleman. And so he told the soldiers to lock her in this room there at his camp. And he called for one of the women that was at the camp that did the washing. <coughs> and he told her that he needed for her to go and search him. All right, here she is. She has this message. Don't know how big it was, don't know where it was hidden. Probably in her pockets. If you've seen the clothes, the attire that the women wore back then, they wore pockets that were tied around their waist that had openings in them. Sometimes there was one pocket, sometimes there was two. And so probably this message, I feel like, maybe was down in one of those pockets. She figured that she had to do something quickly. She knew she had to do something quickly. So she started tearing up the message and eating it. One little piece at a time. I'm thinking that probably didn't taste too good. <laughs> I'm just thinking. And with nothing to drink to help, you know, you know, your mouth get dry. We've all been there, you know, with that kind of thing. She was sort of in a pickle, but it was so interesting to read about this. Just as she heard that washerwoman come in to um, check her out and see if she could find the message, she had one more one more piece to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And she thought, okay. And so she put her head down over her and acted like she was crying. Gentlemen, tears can work. 
Uh, just saying. Uh, so she started crying, and the woman came in, you know, said, are you okay, blah, 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 you know, this kind of thing. And of course, it gave her those few more minutes to get rid of and to finish the, um, eating the message. Okay, nothing was fatal, needless to say. And Robin being the, I think we've already seen with this part of the story that he, he was a gentleman, and she did, he did the, they did not find anything about her, uh, with her, you know, so he couldn't accuse her of being a spy because there was no evidence. He sort of had to believe her, even though it did sound quite fishy. He let her go, and in fact, he sent a soldier with her to get her to her next, to another uh, house that was along the way. Isn't that amazing? That's that's amazing. amazing. Just, just truly, you know? Um, so that the guy left her. They rode all night, and until and by that time they were pretty far from Lord Robin's camp. And she stayed there and rested for a little bit longer. And then she got up the next morning and started riding again. And by three o'clock that afternoon, she found Thomas Sumter's camp. She, of course, can you imagine, just weary, just wiped out, I guess we would say. Green had told her, even though she didn't have the written proof, Sumter believed her, and within an hour, Thomas Sumter and his men were off to t do what General Green had asked them to do. <coughs> That's pretty much in the story. She stayed about a week with her uncle, went back home, probably recouping, you know what I'm thinking? Just a little bit, three days, side saddle, horseback riding. Mm. Um, and, and the fear factor, y'all, you know? Had to be a lot of with this. And then she went back home, and that's pretty much all we know about this story about England. She married after the war. She married a wealthy planner named John Freewitz. They lived on the Congaree River in South Carolina. DAR, South Carolina DAR, has recognized her as a patriot. We have a chapter here from South Carolina named after her. Um, there is a marker that's been placed in her honor. And I guess. All of that, even though we don't know much, we do know enough to know that this woman, among so many others, fought for our country, just like their husbands, their fathers, their brothers, their sons, during the Revolutionary War. I happened to find a uh, copy of her wedding invitation that's the only physical evidence I can find anywhere without going to where the marker is uh, about her and her life. But I thought that was so interesting. Um, gentlemen, you might not be quite so interested in it as the ladies might be. But it's, it's handwritten, you know, which would have been right with the times. They would have handwritten it and then passed it around to whomever would have been taken by messenger to the different homes in the country. Um, I want to share another quote with you. In 1840, Charles Francis Adams, he was the grandson of President John Adams and Abigail Adams, he wrote, quote, the heroism of the females of the revolution has gone from memory with this generation that witnessed it and nothing, absolutely nothing, remains upon the ear of the young of the present Unquote. We need to remember the ladies. If you're familiar with that series um, ATV put out uh, about John Adams, we see a lot of that. We see Abigail Adams' influence 
on him. And of course, she's just one among many. But in one of the letters that she wrote uh, to her husband when they were working on the uh, Declaration of Independence, one of the lines in it was, remember the ladies. Great words. Remember the ladies. And I think as we're looking at the 250th in 2026 anniversary of our country, I'm going to encourage you to remember the ladies. Yes, sir. I remember reading the book one time about the ladies of South Carolina. And yes, they were referred to as steel ladies. That's right. Exactly right. <coughs> and when you hear stories like this, you, you see, we can see why. We really can. I've read so many stories about the Tories coming into their homes and threatening them with all manner of whatever. And sometimes those things were done, too. But they threw them out of their homes, put them on the one side, and they still <coughs> didn't give up. They didn't give up. They protected their children, and they tried to do for their husbands and them for it. Always. Yeah. We should talk to people. Yes. Yes. That's it. Yes, sir. What town was this all taking place in? What area? It's in the Columbia area today. And was there a battle afterwards? Not there, no. They ended up being closer to Charleston when they finally sort of sandwiched around the end. And it doesn't really have a name because it didn't last that long. And he went off, and it was just a crazy kind of battle. I'll put it that way. Sir? Picture Yes. Sir. Hope it doesn't break. PBS also has a Dyson Langston series series on YouTube. I forgot about that. Yes. Dyson Langston from this part of our state, Greenville, we would say today. Uh, Amazing, another amazing woman. There's so good biography written about her too that um, that gives a lot of information. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.